Welcome to the Finding Free Thought podcast. This podcast is funded by you. To support our work, please consider making a purchase from our Free Thought shop. Check out my campsite at campsite.bio/goodresonance, where you can follow me on social media, make a donation, subscribe to my newsletter, check out my essential oils offerings, and grab my restorative teas ebook. Please subscribe to the audio version of this podcast on Apple and Podbean, and the video version on YouTube and Rumble. Be sure to check out my six-episode sci-fi comedy series, Simon Essler's Dystopian Imaginarium, along with my 60-minute comedy special, Theorize About Conspiracies, and my three-season hit show, Worlds Within, all on Rise TV. And don't forget to hit up simonessler.com for all of my work, to join my newsletter, for links to purchase my NFTs, make donations, and follow me on all social media. You can also join my Locals community, Team Free Thought, at teamfreethought.locals.com where I'll be offering subscribers previews of new sketch comedy material, documentary work, and private broadcasts for supporters only. As a member of Team Free Thought, $5 a month gets you all of that, plus a 15% discount at the Free Thought Shop. Today, in the first episode of our Group Think series, Simon got the chance to sit down with Jordan Sather to talk about Group Think and UFOlogy, spirituality, religion, and patriotism. Jordan Sather has worked in the truth or conspiracy space as a thought leader and major target of the legacy media for over five years now. Given that he is one of the most censored individuals in the space, he tends to be a poster boy for taking flack for being over the target. Having recently gone on his Conspiracy Analytical podcast, I noticed that there were groupthink type responses arising in the wake of him challenging certain narratives and wanted to explore his thoughts on the groupthink phenomenon as it arises in conspiracy culture and ufology. I've known Jordan for many years now and was genuinely intrigued by his insights into this topic. Given that his latest work exposing psychological operations into the truth movement has been given the bump by three-star general Michael Flynn, a man who worked in information warfare, I felt he was greatly qualified. Having worked together in the ufology space, I knew Jordan had been inside the alleged vetting process of some of the bigger names in ufology, and so, without naming any names, we took the time to explore his experiences emerging from these inner circles and how he sees things now from an elevated perspective. In addition to exploring groupthink within conspiracy and ufology, the latter half of the interview also gave us a chance to peer into Jordan's work with We the Media and how he perceives groupthink from the lens of religion and patriotism. This was a side of Jordan few have had the chance to explore. You can find all of Jordan's work at jordansather.com. We hope you enjoy the first episode of our Groupthink series. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Finding Free Thought podcast. Today, I have Jordan Sather. Jordan, thanks so much for coming on the show, brother. Yeah, absolutely. You came on my podcast a couple months back, so now I'm returning the favor. Yes, and it's nice to see Conspiracy Analytica still chugging along. It's a really great idea. Mm -hmm. Um, So let's just give a little overview on on who you are and what your jam is and, you know, where you have found yourself over the past, what, like five or six years? Or how long has it been that you've been in this space? Yeah, man. So pretty much just over five years ago is when I first started my YouTube channel and started uploading videos to that. Uh, and I guess early on too, I was I tried writing a couple of blogs for Justin Deschamps as well at Stillness in the Storm. So uh, anyway, writing the blogs didn't work out. Figured a YouTube channel would be better, and then I I plowed into that. January 2017, I think was my first video on there, and it uh, it exploded. Q came onto the scene. I started reporting on that. I was of course reporting on space and ufology and whatnot back then too. And I've always had a uh, passion in health and self-development. So that was another big topic. It was very, very varied in what I was discussing. I was kind of very very realistic in my thought process and my information. So uh, 2018, 19 came around. So did the censorship. 2020 came around. Censorship got even worse. But then the whole scamdemic came out too. And um, I was a big proponent of various uh, treatments, cures, we can use a four letter C word cures and whatnot for that. So that brought my reporting on COVID brought a lot of followers also brought a lot more censorship and a lot of attacks too. So anyway, later 2020, I've got censored off of pretty much every big tech platform you can think of. I think the number is up to like 18 or 19 now that I've been taken down from, but YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, 
Facebook, everything, PayPal, Patreon. Uh, and now I'm pretty much just surviving on the underground platforms, Telegram, Gab, Truth Social, videos going up to Rumble. Uh, it's been it's been a slow rebuilding process for me since I got wiped off of pretty much everything because it was all at once, man. It was October 2020, pretty much every platform that same month wiped me off. So since then, it's been a slow rebuilding, but... Um, just still doing the same, the same sort of content reporting on the same things and trying some new stuff out too. I have that conspiracy analytica podcast that you just mentioned. So I started that a few months ago because I saw, I guess, you know, we go through changes and shifts through our content and what we discuss, right? So early on 2017, 18, I was talking a lot more about ufology and that sort of stuff. Then a few years after that, I guess I got more political since Q came onto the scene and all that. So I was talking about political type stuff, still interested in ufology and whatnot, but um, shifted a little bit just because I, I saw, or at least I believe that there were certain things that were more, more important, more pertinent to discuss at that time. Um, and now for the last maybe six months or so, I've come to be known as like the the asshole in the whole disclosure or truth movement because I notice a lot of infiltration going on and not just infiltration, but also just some just grifters, just general grifters or con artists that are descending onto the truth movement, patriot movement, disclosure movement, whatever you want to call it, right? There's like one name you could give the overarching truth movement, but then it has different niches in it. And in these niches, we've got opportunists that are descending on it, whether they are just looking for money or fame or whether they are knowing shills, whether they are actual assets tasked to infiltrate these different movements. But um, this whole truth movement is basically like a wild west. It's like a wild west. There is essentially zero accountability for what you say. And we do love our freedom of speech laws in in America and in this world, right? Free speech is important, but where's the line between, okay, you're clearly lying to people and you're clearly bullshitting them. And where's the accountability for that, right? So, I mean, we have clowns, jumping into this truth movement they'll say whatever people want to hear they'll amass 10,000 100,000 followers and they're just saying the craziest stuff like they're claiming to have inside contact with Trump's team or they're claiming they signed NDAs non-disclosure agreements and they're getting briefings from the military and they're claiming this quantum financial system is going to get activated it's like what what what's going on here right so to me it it disgusts me This type of behavior absolutely disgusts me because not only are these people being manipulative, they're using their audiences, using them for money or fame or whatnot. Um, They're making all of our job tougher because the mainstream media weaponizes their misinformation. So my gosh, just this last week, the mainstream media, different outlets have put out hit pieces about med beds and Nazara and uh, the venom water stuff. That's a great one. So their hit pieces, the mainstream media, by weaponizing this disinformation, they then make us all look stupid. And really from a big picture, it makes our job, all of our jobs, a lot more difficult. So I've been calling that out a lot recently. I've even created Telegram channels and podcasts like purely devoted to exposing this sort of clickbait and the people who perpetuate it. And that's gotten me, uh, (laughs) people either love me or hate me for it. I've got some people that, are incredibly thankful that I'm calling out that sort of stuff. And then on the other hand, I've got some folks that are just, they're getting the cognitive dissonance. They're incredibly triggered. They think I'm a CIA shill or something like that. Jordan's got to be paid to be doing this stuff or whatever, but I just feel like it needs to be done. So that's where I'm at now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, no, I'm a very appreciative of it as well, because as far as I could tell, no one, no one else was really, you know, drawing some hard lines in the sand and pointing out mm-hmm. what was going on, like that those those corrupt forms of information, those have been around for a long time. You know, like I got into the conspiracy movement, I think, you know, probably like well over 10, 
10 years ago at least. And I remember Nisara and Jisara from like way back when I first got in. Like right? that narrative is old, 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 old. So for me, seeing it still being around, but still being in the exact same place, nothing has changed, nothing has come out. There's been no movement. And they've been baiting people with that exact narrative for so many years, for over a decade now. So to me, right. you know, it's obvious. And exact same with me. I started getting into the conspiracy world circa 2011 or 12. So for me, it's been about 10 years too. Um, how old are you? 38. 38. Okay. I'm 31. So it was about 10 years ago for me as well. And um, I got sucked into the Nazara, Jazara crap back then as well. And I, I totally bought it. I thought that some secret law was signed and, and it's going to get rolled out by the military and we're all going to get magic money in our bank accounts or something like that. Like it's, <laughs> it's pretty insane that I believed it, but you know, when yeah. you're so new to this stuff that yeah. it's, you don't know left from right. You're trying to make sense of the world and you can get caught up with some pretty silly stuff, but um, I believed it for a solid year, year and a half, maybe. And then eventually I just realized like, wow, it's actually this fan fiction story that people are running some online scams with. And it's been that way actually since the 90s in regards to Nazar Jazara for like 20, 25 years, internet yeah. grifters have been running scams with it. So um, it just over time, I realized that it was, it was trash. And I had also been following people about 10 years ago who were claiming to get briefings from the military. They had insiders and mass arrests are going to come next week. They're imminent. They're imminent. Some people have been saying they're imminent for 10 years, right? A long so, time. Yeah. Okay. Well, time. actually, so let's get into some of that, actually, because yeah. you've been up close and in that world to an extent because you you really did get the chance to meet alleged insiders, people, you know, alleging to show you military qualifications. Like you were in some of that world quite deep, right? And, you know, as was I. And then at some point, there was this moment of, of climbing up onto the roof and taking a hard look at the scene as a whole. So, you know, like considering Jordan before he had any idea there was secret space programs or anything like that, right? Like, where have you made your own discoveries emerging from groupthink when it comes to ufology? You know, so like, what were you caught up in in ufology and what have you come out of now being wiser for having been wrong? Yeah, so, you know, I started following the ufology spectrum around the same time, right? 2011, 12. I just, when I started questioning things around then, it was down every single rabbit hole I could find as fast and as deep as I could get down it. So that, that was actually a pretty traumatic uh, time for me. And that's probably why I was so easy to believe like whatever I found and, oh, here's a few different people talking about it. So maybe it really is true because I'm seeing quote different sources talk about it. Um, and yeah, I was following some of the popular UFO personalities around 2012, 13, 14. At that point, I was just reading their stuff. And I was, I was not anti what some of these people were saying, but I don't know if I was totally sold on it. And um, come 2016, 17, like I said, I wrote a, I wrote a few blogs. I was I was trying to get into being a content creator because uh, I just I just felt like I needed to do it. I wanted to get everything. I was learning all this information out to more people. I saw YouTube, social media as a, an avenue I could do that. So I figured, boom, I'll start a YouTube channel. And I was creating videos. I was acquiring a following. And I had my YouTube channel for about six months when I was invited to go to Contact in the Desert. It was a it's a UFO conference that takes place every June in the Palm Springs area of California. Probably one of the biggest UFO conferences that are out there. A few thousand people go every year. So I went to contact in the desert because I'm the kind of learner where I want to get in and just experience it. I don't, I don't like to spend too much time reading and, and keeping it a distance. If I want to learn about something, I'm going to get in there, get my hands dirty and even if I make a load of mistakes, which I've done plenty of times before, I feel like experience is the best teacher. So I was like, okay, I'll, I want to go to this conference. I want to meet some of these people. I want to talk to them. Maybe I'll even work with them and we'll see if they're real or not. So I went to the conference 
met a lot of great people and met some of the folks that I, that had claimed to be secret space program insiders or whistleblowers or whatever. I even met them and uh, started working with them, a few of them. And I was still like, I don't know if I was totally sold, but I was, I was going in and working with them and right. Still just trying to see, still just trying to figure things out, figure out if, if stuff is really real or not. I mean, some of the things I was hearing from these so-called insiders or secret space program, whistleblower people, some of them sounded crazy, but I didn't want to disregard something that might be true. Kept working with them for a few years. Now it came till about, let's see, 2017 is when I first started working and meeting with some of the ufology people. Then it was about 2020. So we'll say about three years was when I just had to like, it got too weird for me. It got too weird. The sauce was not provided. Claim after claim after claim came by. And then I just didn't, I didn't see what was like, there wasn't anything there really to back it up, to prove it. And then um, also there was the, an ex a, per a particular experience I had where I did travel to meet, uh, this was in 2018. I traveled for a weekend to meet some so-called insiders. Uh, I like how you use the word alleged multiple times because that's exactly what it was, alleged, supposedly. And okay, so I'm there for a weekend with a couple very well-known names in ufology, right? Um, we meet a couple of individuals who have claimed to be insiders and even these influencers who I was there with had told me that they were insiders, like they're insiders. And I'm like, look at any of these people. I'm just, I wasn't feeling it. They, they didn't provide any good sauce or good evidence that they're actually inside the certain circles that they insinuated themselves to be inside. And it just, I wasn't, I wasn't sold by it, right? So anyway, I left that place I was at and I'd never, I'd never spoken publicly about it. I didn't, I didn't click bait with me meeting insiders or anything like that because I wasn't sold on it. The following year, I think I was back at Contact in the Desert. I was, I was at one of those UFO conferences with the influencers that I was there at that insiders. For people watching this on the audio, there was some big, air quotes there when I said <laughs> insiders. Um, I was there at, I think it was contact in the desert again with the, the well-known influencer that I was there at the meeting with. And um, well-known influencer, I agreed to go on to a panel he was holding and well-known influencer introduced me when I got onto the panel and told the audience there was like 800 people in the crowd or something like that. Like, oh, Jordan, we went to meet insiders together. And I was like, number one, nothing. That's nothing I ever wanted to say publicly. Yeah. Uh, he didn't. He didn't even ask me whether or not to talk about it or or anything like that. I didn't know he was going to say that. Number two, I was like, how are you claiming these people were insiders? Based off what, right? It was like mind blowing to me. Mm. So that then really made me question every single other so-called insider that said well-known influencer had ever, ever promoted publicly, right? And not just him, but like a certain cast of characters that were in that sort of ufology group. Because when it comes to the UFO community, and I'm, you know this very well, there's like groups, there's a lot of little cliques around the UFO community, right? And this particular clique I was working with at the time around 2018-19, I mean, there was, there was a lot of like insiders say my insiders, my, the briefings I get sort of stuff. I think some of these characters even still to this day claim they get briefings and have insiders and all that. So anyway, this one experience, and then the fact that this person was trying to sell these folks we met as being insiders. And then on a stage to thousand people, I was, it left such a bad taste in my mouth. Mm. So then after that experience, the following six to nine months or so. Again, this was in 2019. 
Then, like I said, in 2020, I kind of really pulled away from a lot of those UFO people I was working with because not only did the insider say stuff really weird me out, but then uh, information, man, their actual information just started getting bad. Their discernment was getting worse and worse. And I don't know if it was me just kind of like breaking the maybe I had a little false idolism in my eyes around these people, around these groups. I don't know if it was me growing up or them getting worse. Maybe it was a little bit of both, but I, I just like, wow, their discernment is actually trash. It's actually not that good. Um, so yeah, man. Yeah. You know, this like, is I really important. Cause it, like it qualifies you in a lot of ways because I think it's, it's pretty rare, you know, to, to actually get into the heart of, these sort of insider situations and to really get an up close look at whether or not there is a vetting process that we're being told that there is exactly. right. And, and a lot of people, they put faith into the vetting process of certain thought leaders. And, and I, I don't even know if they realize the extent to which they are replacing their discernment with what they assume to be the vetting process of a thought leader in the community. And I think that's, that's a lot of what's going on. And so, you know, considering like recent, sort of waves being made in the ufology community and like accusations being thrown at you you know it is interesting to me that that you've been into the heart of that beast and seen it from the inside so that you know that that pulling back and that getting that larger perspective you know to me i think that's like invaluable insight into into these inner workings of what's going on and and to what extent we're looking at malicious corruption versus just lack of integrity and right. it's a mixed bag, right? Like it's really hard to sort out what is what, but I think that's really, really important. So, you know. Yeah, that's a that's a great way you put it there, saying that people, there's a blind trust there. Working word, blind trust. You're saying, oh, I think this person is a good person. So I'm going to trust that they vetted this person or that their, you know, their words are legit or whatever. And you also bring up a fantastic point there in that you have to differentiate between somebody who is consciously deceiving, like they know they're bullshitting you, or they're just being a useful idiot. And whether they're in denial of their own lack of discernment, or they don't realize that they're promoting misinformation or what have you. Um, when, when, I, when I do my clickbait exposing on the internet, right? I try very hard to give the benefit of the doubt to the person and say, you know, maybe they're just a useful idiot. Maybe they don't realize that they're promoting this misinformation or whatnot, but you also can't lie to yourself. And when the red flags go up over and over and over again, and this person just continues promoting bad claims or misinformation or something like that, then it's like, okay, something's up here. Either they are so stuck in their own delusion, they just can't admit their discernment sucks because they like the money or the fame getting or whatever or they are knowingly bullshitting you, right? So, and again, it placing intentions upon somebody, that's like, that's very tough to do. I mean, in a court of law as well, you have to have like really good evidence to know somebody's intentions. And that's why it can often be tough to, to win lawsuits and whatnot. But uh, yeah, speaking of lawsuits, a lot of those going around UFO community, huh? But uh, yeah. yeah, anyway. Um, so I don't like, I try really hard not to place intention. Like I'm not saying this person has an intent to deceive. I'm just purely looking at performance. And the performance here is like, it's trash. And then people get upset for me with me because I say, oh, this person is actually like, what they're saying is not that good. That's not a personal attack from me against them. That's just, it is what it is. That's the truth, right? That's reality. So yeah. anyway, um, well, I yeah, think if man, people I are going to devote, like if people are going to devote years of their lives to this information and you spend years and years digging through it and nothing comes from that, right? Like right. nothing finally comes from that. There aren't the, I mean, personally in your own growth as a human being, but also just in the world, you know, 
uh, there's, there's a lot to that. Like we give a lot of energy to certain bodies of information. Oh man. You know, that's a lot of people's life energy. People are devoting huge amounts of creativity and analysis and content creation into this. So, right. You know, and you mentioned earlier, like people get really like mad at me and there's been all co- kinds of rumors going around about me, especially in the UFO community. They like, oh, they claim, oh, Jordan's just tripping off his ego. He's being so negative. Something changed in him or, or whatnot. And yeah, something changed, but it's like, it's not me tripping off my ego. It's me noticing others who are tripping off their ego and they're projecting at me saying that I'm the bad guy. But uh, exactly like you said, I've devoted 10 years to researching this stuff, five years to it almost literally being my job. So I'm not just devoting like one or two hours a day when I have the time to into researching this, but I'm devoting 10 to 12 to 14 hours a day researching this stuff and not just researching it, but experiencing like going to two dozen UFO conferences over the last few years and traveling and meeting these people, working with them, going to their homes, going to these meetings and stuff. And um, maybe it's because of my, my youth, maybe it's because I'm younger or I, I, you know, I, I do have a brash sort of attitude. I do know that, but, uh, Sometimes I do that on purpose just to ruffle some jimmies and see what shakes out, right? So who knows what the reasoning is, but all kinds of projection comes my way and people think that I'm just tripping off an ego with what I say. But no, I mean, I have a very good reason as to why I'm singling this person out or that person out or singling out this claim or this claim is because I've spent a lot of hours. I lived it. I went through it. I tried, I like tried to believe this crap. Right. But it just didn't pan out. So, um, now I'm, I'm, I feel like there's almost a responsibility there. Right. So I had all these experiences. I used to believe the crap. I believe Nazar. I believe this, these whistleblowers and the insider stuff, but, uh, I had the personal experience of finding out it wasn't true. So because of that, now I almost feel like it's a responsibility to warn others and warn others about who might be real or not and what uh, claims are real and not. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at now. And okay. So I have a quote here. This is recently, uh, this is from Austin Steinbart. And I thought this was a a pretty, I've I've been trying not to name names in this podcast, but, uh, well, this is, this is a quote from him that he put out in a video. So I just, I want to use it because it, it, to me, it's indicative of a lot of things. He said, he said he claims that your message is everyone needs to not listen to anybody who they deem to be bad and who doesn't agree with them fully. The only reason I bring that up is because I see word salads like this a lot that sort of they claim that you're saying people can and cannot believe certain bodies of material. Right. right? Uh, there's that. And, 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 you know, this was my personal experience after going on Conspiracy Analytica. I got like waves and waves of attacks and people coming at me being like, how could you go on that podcast? He's telling everyone what to believe. He's telling everyone that they can and cannot follow this information. And I've never seen, you know, yeah, that it kind of shocked me. It was where did those, where did those attacks mainly come from? Like what group or what community? I would say it's like sort of spiritual ufology community for sure. Absolutely. And like just comments on other unrelated videos you know, like content I'm putting out that has nothing to do with that podcast, comments coming up. Uh, and I had never experienced anything so obviously. And, and to me, the, the only reason that quote was interesting to me is because it, it's a repetition of this, the same, the same, uh, I guess, accusation that, yeah. that you're telling people what to believe and what not to believe. Uh, and I've, I've personally never seen you make any kind of definitive claim like that. So, right. And it's, it's just like an easy, it's an easy rhetoric that people can throw out against me so they can stay in their little comfort zone and feel like they're the ones in the right and I'm wrong. Right. And I think if you go through my work from my post to what I say in my videos and all that, you'll be hard pressed to find me ever telling you not to follow somebody. In fact, whenever I call somebody out, I will screenshot their post. I'll put a link to their YouTube video. I'll find a clip 
a 30 second minute long clip from their video and post it with exactly what I'm talking about. And then say, this is what I find to be bullshit, right? I'm very opinionated. Maybe it's because I'm so opinionated, but that sets people off and gives them a bad taste about me or something. But uh, <laughs> I don't tell people not to follow. In fact, what I usually say is that, yeah, go follow them. Go, go follow them. I just urge caution. And I'll say, you know, you're free, so let's use flat earth, right? Or Austin Steinbart claiming he's Q. You're free to believe Austin Steinbart wrote the Q post. It's your, it's your choice. It's your free will. But it's also my choice and within my free will to call you dumb for believing Austin Steinbart wrote the Q drops or call you dumb for believing the earth is flat. You can get upset with me for calling that dumb. That's fine. I'm not telling you not to believe it, not telling you not to follow it, whatever. You know, and, and I think, I think in our world, in our society, we too much tolerate what should be not tolerated and we don't tolerate what should be tolerated. So, and I bring that up, for instance, man, we really need to call out dumb ideas. For, and we get so upset, like, oh, don't be negative. Don't be negative. What? Why is calling out something untrue negative? Since when was that negative? It's this weird spin, right? And I see that. I see that all the time. Like, oh, Jordan's being negative. Um. Okay. So how? How am I being negative? It's the particular energy the person is feeling within them about something, some belief that they hold near and dear and true to their heart. That belief gets called out, they get upset. It's just, it's pure cognitive dissonance. It's a reaction to cognitive dissonance, right? And somebody that doesn't have that emotional attachment won't be upset. They won't think it's negative. They'll in fact think it's positive. They'll say, oh yeah, absolutely. Call that shit out. Can't believe people are believing that sort of stuff, right? So yeah, it's just, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance going around, but I'm the kind of person where I just I get right there in it and you got to shake the shake the tree loose sometimes, you know, put a spotlight on those cockroaches. So they, so they scatter. And it's just, it's kind of a way the ufology and spiritual community works. It's, it's a fake spirituality. It's yeah. a fake spirituality. People just want to be comfortable in their little beliefs and they think they're getting awakened and becoming more conscious and all that, but they're just going from one form of brainwashing being the mainstream media, the establishment to another form of brainwashing. <laughs> they're not, yeah. not actually waking up and uh it's it's like i was mentioning earlier it's holding all of us back right staying in the and you, you're calling this a group think podcast or, or uh, an a episode about group. yeah 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 series about it which is this is the exact problem you know we're moving from one form of brainwashing to another form of brainwashing and it's almost worse because we think we're becoming awakened and aware when it's still the same the same habits it's the habits we need to get down into changing the subconsciousness thinking you're conscious doesn't get you conscious. You actually have, you actually have to act and be able to set yourself apart, detach from different beliefs or personalities because both of them will reel you in with emotion and you have to be able to detach from that emotion, not, not, get rid of that emotion. It's very important when you're angry or you're upset or you're happy to let those emotions th flow through you, but you can't let those emotions control you. And that's a big problem. People will, especially over the last year, um, they want to believe whatever makes them happy and comfortable about the world. Like, oh yeah, Joe Biden's a clone and there's tribunals going on under the white house and all these, all these deep staters are already in Gitmo and all that sort of stuff. It's like, ugh, that's, yeah, well, and this these are this is fodder, you know, for for the mainstream media. It's like on the one hand, you have someone like yourself in the community saying, "Okay, well, that's a dumb idea. Don't waste your time on this. Like your time is precious." Exactly. So, your attention is something to be respected. And so, it's like you said, if you see people getting caught up in this, you want to say, "Hey, that's dumb because if enough of us pour energy into it, then it becomes something that the mainstream media then gets to spin and say, "Look at how dumb these people are." Exactly. And that works. It has worked many times. Flat Earth is probably the best example, uh, but you have recent examples like the 
you know, the, the Venom, you know, narrative and a lot of stuff coming, you know, coming out of like that realm of information. So, you know, I think it is, like I was saying, having been in it for this many years and being able to get up on the roof and look at it from this larger perspective, you really see which bodies of information have paid off in a practical way, have helped us progress and mature as a community, you know, because it is important that we mature as a community, especially a community that is going to continue to be under attack, right? There's going to be perpetual waves of psychological and information warfare lodged at us in addition to just confused, useful idiots. And it's a pretty big mess to sort out, you know? Uh, and so- Correct. And, and we really need to do better with the vetting process and not blindly believe what somebody says. Because still, I mean, you got to, this is, I, I often find this a lot on like Telegram and comments, for instance, people will say, I like this person. I like so-and-so. Oh, I like them. Who gives a shit whether, whether you like them or not, right? Who cares? When it comes to truth, you can have somebody that's incredibly likable have bad discernment or, or just fumble the ball once. Maybe their discernment's great a lot, but for some reason, like this one thing or maybe this one so-called insider ropes them in and they're getting used by them. Promote them. So we have to do away again with like liking and also the blind belief. And also like you brought up the vetting, the vetting process again, like what I saw during that one instance I was talking about a few minutes ago, I saw like no vetting at all. And yeah. then these days, you know, freaking secret space program, whistleblower, super soldier people are like a dime a dozen. Um, you got YouTube videos all over the place. The people who claim to be whistleblowers coming out and you got to ask like, what's the vetting process? And also one more point is that talk is cheap. Talk is so incredibly cheap. And how easy is it to just talk to a camera for an hour a day, turn that camera off and then be completely, be a completely different person. Some people are very good at acting and being two faced and being something Totally different when the cameras are on, totally different when the cameras are off. And then also with this internet age we're in, I mean, all we, so many people jump to conclusions about folks on the screen, just, just through what they've heard about the person on their computer screen. How can you really know somebody or really know a situation just from what you see and also what they say, right? Again, talk is cheap. Who cares if somebody calls themselves a patriot or a truth seeker or claims so-and-so is legit or this and that happened? You, you have to actually make sure that that person is walking the walk, not just talking the talk, right? And uh, so anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think too, like, it's like you said, and I had this experience too. When you first dive into those initial rabbit holes and you're first waking up, it's a little bit traumatic. You're very, you're extremely open because like the trauma of realizing there's so many lies, it really opens yeah. you up, right? Which makes you very vulnerable. So I think when you get into concepts like synchronicity, for example, right? Someone who's very new on their path and they're, they're sort of traumatized, but they're also very excited because like the whole world is opening up to them. And so I know I had, I had this where it's like, wow, like I'm going to give this information more time because I had so many synchronicities around it which doesn't delegitimize the notion of synchronicity because I think when you're waking up to the lies of this world, you are, you are awakening spiritually to an extent, right? You are, you're coming into your own truth to an extent. And so I think there is a synchronicity experience that everyone has that sort of encourages you to move along that path. But at the same time, it leaves you very vulnerable to psychological and information-based manipulation you know, and I, I think another, that's another fantastic point you bring up is the trauma period. You know, we have to learn to deal with that trauma before the, the or I, I say the more you deal with that trauma, the better your discernment is going to be because you'll have a better handle on your emotions. And when people start waking up and by start, I mean, it could be like a two, three year process to really start questioning things deal with that internal trauma, both conscious and subconscious of realizing how screwed up this world is 
and how screwed up people can be. So, yeah, I mean, when we have that trauma within us of the world, we're so easy to, it, we just get our little egos get so upset that we don't know, like we don't know what's going on. And that's why people latch onto crazy clickbait so easily is because that empty ego inside them, um, they, they still feel like they need to, they need to know, they need to know what's going on. I need to yeah. find some insider on the internet to know what's going on. So I can feel comfortable and I can feel like I'm in control. Sometimes, man, you just have to be okay with not knowing. Hell yeah. You have to Absolutely. be okay with not having an insider or not. Right. And that's, that's kind of like the next spiritual lesson. The first one, like you mentioned, could be, okay, I'm waking up. Uh, I'm realizing that the mainstream and the establishment, all of that's BS. So that that's kind of spiritual growth to an extent. You said to an extent. And then the next stage of that would be, okay, all the crap I'm learning in conspiracy land, that's not automatically true. And then also understanding that, well, the deep state, they are absolutely going to infiltrate the truth movement because we are the biggest targets. We are the biggest threats. We're the people who are questioning things and starting to get awakened. So hell yeah, they're going to be infiltrating the truth movement. They've been doing that since the 1960s. That's right. Go and tell pro back then. So then you actually have to question more once you get into conspiracy theory land. And, um, you know, eventually over time, like I said, it could take two or three years just to wake up to the mainstream garbage. And then it might take another two or three years to really get a sense of what's real and what's not in, in truth movement land. And then you'll be able to, you know, hang on your own and, and you just have to keep questioning, right? You have to keep questioning and get away from the group think, not just the group think in this mainstream realm, but group think there's plenty of it in truth movement realm. And, kind of while we're on while we're on this subject and having the UFO being kind of the the ufology community being the bridge between all these things we're discussing that's that's something I've uh we were talking about this before we started recording here and uh it's weird how there's this dichotomy kind of occurring in the UFO community in that over here on our left we have the people who pretty much just buy whatever the mainstream media is selling in terms of UFOs, they're all big Tom DeLonge fanboys. They think that Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon going on CNN and Fox News and all those interviews, 100% legit. They just buy whatever the mainstream media is putting out about UFOs. They don't question it any deeper. So there's a big problem in that line of thinking. And then to our right over here, we've got this group think. And this group think, they just buy whatever the latest super soldier secret space program alleged whistleblower is saying on a YouTube video and, oh, this person claims to be channeling. They must automatically be. So I'm over here, like looking to my right and left, figuring that there's, man, everybody's full of shit. So where's that, like, where's that middle path where you can believe that well, there probably are secret space programs out there. What's Lockheed really been doing for the last 50 years with those billions of dollars? But that doesn't mean that all these whistleblowers are legit or that all these channelers are channeling. And then, oh, over here, yeah, the mainstream media, they're, they're admitting to UFOs, but what's the catch here, right? So I don't know. I know there's a lot of thinkers out there that are kind of understanding my point here and also in that middle path with me, but yeah. I'm yep. just trying to get more people there, get more people questioning. No, that middle path is crucial. And I think, you know, it's really important for people to understand that, you know, you're not just coming from the position of being right. You're coming from like myself, having been wrong. Correct. And, Absolutely. And, you know, and then moving forward from having been wrong. And I think, you know, it's very painful for some people. Um, okay. Yeah, well, I'm, I I'm wrong a lot. People get this idea in their head that, oh, Jordan thinks he's the only truth seeker and we should only listen to him. No, not at all. I've been wrong a lot, which is why maybe it's a little easier for me to tell who else out there is wrong because I'm not in denial about my own wrongness in the past. And I think I mentioned this at the beginning of the show. I'm, I'm, I'm a person who learns through experience. So I just dive in and I mess up and I mess up. But by me messing up and seeing my mess ups, then 
I could figure out how to get it right. So I think a lot of folks out there are just kind of still in denial about their own mess ups and they need to kind of admit it to themselves and oh, this belief I'm holding, that's kind of silly. I better uh, leave that behind and find something, find something better. Or when it comes to these content creators, they might be in denial. We might have some out there that are knowingly bullshitting for money or whatever, but I think, you know, I think um, there's a lot of content creators out there who are just being useful idiots, not realizing that they're being a little irresponsible or reckless and they need to stop being in denial about that and kind of have a, have their own little come to Jesus moment and say, Oh man, these things I'm saying, or these guests I'm having on are kind of trash. I need to get my act together because it's, it's pretty irresponsible to put yourself in a leader position and try to gain a following if you're not if your performance is going to suck. Like sure, they could have A plus personalities, be great people, but if their performance is an F, we can't afford that right now. In this information war we're in, we can't afford to waste time and to put out some garbage content that's going to mislead 50,000 people, you know? So it's not a time to have, to be making JV mistakes when we need to, especially if you're going to, again, put yourself out there as a leader. If you're going to take the torch and try to be that person that folks are going to follow, well, you better get your shit together, right? And if you don't have your shit together and you get called out for it, don't get upset. Don't project and say, oh, that person's being negative or they got an ego. Don't listen to them. No. That's constructive criticism, right? It's constructive criticism. Granted, some criticisms out there aren't constructive, but uh, if it is a constructive pr- criticism that's not personal and maybe there's something to the point, well, maybe you should listen. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to switch gears a little bit uh, here uh, and move a little, uh, move away from the ufology topic because uh, okay. you're, you're a regular contributor to We The Media. Correct. Right? Uh, and I did notice recently that there was... Uh, you would put out a, a post, uh, I think it was about, I think it was two Peters, maybe. Anyways, the point being that you had talked about, you know, making some connections there and analyzing his position in the community. And some of that got a bump, I think it was from General Flynn, just to call on people to connect the dots and to look more deeply, right? Um, you know, and that, that's an important bump because that's someone who works professionally in information warfare. Uh, and, and I think that's really worth noting here. And so, you know, I, I've been watching your contributions in, in We The Media, and this is an interesting area to explore groupthink from a different lens. So just to get your take, like, what is We The Media and how do you see your position within that entity? So We The Media kind of started back in 2020 when I was on Twitter. A lot of us were still on Twitter and... Um, a group sort of just started forming. We got into a Twitter group, myself, um, a guy by the name of uh, Inevitable ET is his handle. His name is Craig. And there was some of us who were just reporters of Q. We were reporting on Q and politics and uh, we had pretty substantial followings. So we just figured, okay, we got to make like a think tank with a lot of these OG Anons. And we made this Twitter group and then we all started getting censored off Twitter. So we were looking for a new home to go to. And I had been on telegram for a couple of months, just learning the layout of it and all that. And I, I realized that, well, on telegram, you can make one channel and then have like a bunch of different admins be able to post to the same account. And I was like, Oh man, Craig, um, we should, we should go to telegram and make a channel there. And then I don't know who had the We The Media name. I think Craig might've came up with that or Kate, Uh, but it was like the three of us were kind of the initial founders of it. We migrated over to We The Media. We brought a couple dozen other uh, OG Anons and and prolific researchers. And then from there, it just started kind of exploding in popularity because a lot of people were going on to Telegram after getting censored off of big tech, but also how we just had like a constant stream all day long, hundreds of posts a day of the latest news and all that. And then um, a lot of big folks were sharing the account. General Flynn was sharing We The Media a bunch and others as well. So yeah, it became a, it became a really solid kind of group 
that we started and we're still developing. So the other day you, you mentioned Flynn sharing one of my posts and that I was actually very surprised he did because in my post, I was calling out Stu Peters. Um, I, I particularly think Stu Peters is like uh, InfoWars shill myself, but uh, he's like Alex Jones 2.0 basically. So anyway, Stu Peters has been putting out some, some very questionable, in my opinion, very questionable claims on his podcast over the last year. And also he's been attacking people, personal attacks, not even... Uh, not even worthy attacks, but like going after people's personal beliefs or their just weird stuff. Anyway, um, Stu Peters did a segment calling, basically having a guest on and calling General Flynn a deep state general and all this sort of stuff. And I made a I made a post calling out Stu Peters and this stuff, and and Flynn shared it. So you're right, you know, having having somebody who's worked for the military in psyops in information warfare for that long that, that sort of was a confirmation to me that there most definitely are infiltrators not just infiltrators but it's almost like this network it's network of a few dozen influencers that they have as their proxies and they've really since the middle of 2020 that's when i started seeing this network descend upon the patriot movement um but yeah so that's what we do with we the media i'm we kind of think of it as like a platoon of a bunch of different anons everybody has their own particular specialty so we have a couple memers in there and uh, their memes have actually gotten uh gotten pretty popular i think i saw trump jr and scavino post some of their memes before but uh yeah so we we have like our little think tank and our work is actually uh getting out there, making an impact. It's fun. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I, I personally really like, I rely on we, the media a lot. And w one of the reasons I appreciate it is because within the ranks there, you have a certain amount of dissent. Like you're really not all, you don't all think the same, you know? Correct. And this is why I wanted to talk about it uh, because, you know, we, the media having emerged from people who were studying Q and, and at the heart of, of sort of the philosophy that was shared within the drops to me was the concept of free thought. You know, it was very inspiring to me to, to have that campaign be centered around free thought and, and to keep reminding people that you need to learn to think without any attachments to authority, dogma and tradition. And so seeing you guys emerge from that and, and have this media entity in which you guys are different thinkers, like I'm curious about, you know, the way you see groupthink functioning in media media. And I don't mean groupthink necessarily is a bad thing because it is something that we naturally do as humans. Um, yeah. So I'm interested in the way you see free thought and groupthink within we the media, because there's sort of two, there's two ideologies that function within that group that you're not necessarily a part of, right? There's the strong, like Christian revival, you know, some in that group, are strong, strongly coming from that place. But then there's also like the strong patriotism, patriotism and nationalism. So, uh, you know, for you, you don't find yourself in that in alignment with like the strong Christian ideologies, but you're still working within that group. So what have you found like within We The Media, how have you found the process of free thought being protected, but also people's decision to be part of a certain group think to be really deep into patriotism or really deep into christianity but to still be able to work together like how does that function and like what you know ideally have you seen emerge from that because i see it as a pretty good example of having both group think and free thought within the same space yeah this is a really good conversation something i don't know if i've ever touched on or been asked before so thank you for doing it um before we the media i want to talk about the q movement first I think that's one thing that really drew me in to not the Q movement, but the drops, particularly the drops, because it's of my belief. And I think evidence would suggest that the people writing the Q posts, whatever tiny little team of maybe five to 10 people were writing the Q posts. I do think they were military. I do think they had high level access and were directly working with Trump. Okay, so that's one thing I really liked about 
the Q drops from 2017 to 2020 is that, you know, being military, sure, there's going to be a large Christian element associated with that. Most people in the military are Christians, but it wasn't, it wasn't militant. It wasn't a kind of zealotry to it. And there were still uh, what we could say, I don't want to name it new agey because that, you know, that, that word comes with so much baggage, but there, there was a more, it, it wasn't only Christianity there. I could tell through reading the posts that all, all thought processes, all belief systems, it was all welcome. And as long as you weren't a bad person, like harming other people, then it was fine. And then early on in the Q movement, there was a, because I was basically like the first person on YouTube. I was like one of the very first people to start reporting on it. And I, you know, I don't classify myself as a Christian. I really don't like to label myself as anything because I think labels just put you into, put you into a box. But um, yeah, I guess you could say I was more like new agey, especially back then, 2017, 18. Um, it was very, it was very diverse. It was a very diverse spectrum. These days, in terms of the Q movement itself, uh, it has, I think the diversity isn't quite as there as it used to be. Um, could be in part to how the mainstream media is what is attacking Q and they're, they're like forcing it into this Christian box. They're like all right-wing Christians and all this stuff. Um, but it's still like, it's really more diverse than some people tend to think. It's not only right-wing militant Christians that are sort of in the Q movement per se, but there, there's a lot of different religions, belief systems, spirituality leanings that are kind of working for the greater goal there. And that's kind of what we're doing in We the Media. We're just working for the greater goal of freedom, of truth and transparency, especially within our government, and of exposing corruption around the world. These are just kind of very general, very general goals that I think the writers behind Q had in mind, and that also we are applying with We the Media. And exactly, we have some people in We the Media who are very diehard Christians, traditionalist, um, and that's fine. I, I don't. I don't have a problem with that because they are, they're not intolerant. They're not the militant kind. And when I say militant Christianity, I mean the kind who tell you that you're a bad person if you don't, you know, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you're, you're not going to go to heaven or you're, you're, they basically just try to like mentally shame you for not having the same belief that they do or whatever. Um, but you know, that's why really I brought be... this up, actually, because I yeah. saw I saw things lodged at you in comments of, you know, interviews you've done and things like that, basically saying because Jordan doesn't include Jesus, it's absolutely evil to watch his information. He personally removes the spirituality and that is a dark thing to do and you shouldn't follow him because of this. And, you know, I thought that was very interesting because you work in a media organization hand in hand with hardcore Christians. And if right. really, you know, like you're supported by thought leaders who do come from that camp. And so it's interesting that for them, they couldn't see that part of it, that you clearly work with people who are, you know, deep it's into just, Christianity, right? Right. It's just having respect for each other. And, uh, you know, I'm like, I'm like the alien guy in We The Media. And they all, they all, it's like a joke. We a running joke between all of us. I'm the space boy. And they totally respect that. And in fact, years ago, maybe 2018, a couple of people in We the Media, they didn't believe in extraterrestrials at all. It was it was it wasn't even a thought. But because well, Q made those drops, essentially confirming that life exists elsewhere in the cosmos. And then here I am, you know, being so adamant about it. Their their minds have kind of changed. And I would say even my mind has changed about religion in general and Christianity from from 10 years ago, we'll say, you know, I, I used to be a hardcore atheist in high school. I was reading Sam Harris books and uh, Chris Christopher Hitchin books and all that. I was pretty hardcore atheist. 
But as I started growing up, researching things, becoming more aware, then my mind shifted. I did not see religion as the bane of humanity's existence anymore. But I still very much believe that evil forces have infiltrated the church to mind control people and to control the masses. I still very much believe that. Um, I would not classify myself as Christian. If I did, I would, I would take more of like a Gnostic Christian view, whereas most of what was written in the Bible was meant to be allegory, metaphorical. And for some reason, some Christians think that's so heresy. It's, it's terrible. It means you're, you're the devil if you believe that. But I just, you know, that, that kind of cult-like thinking, that militant sort of thinking, I think is exactly what we're trying to get away from. And not, not only does it manifest in religion and Christianity and whatnot, but that kind of militant thinking also manifests in the new age world just, just as yes. fervently, right? They get into their little groups. You got some folks in, um, in the new age land that they think religion is awful and terrible and there's like nothing good that can come of it. But I, I totally disagree. You know, I, I just see religion. Uh, we could specify and say the Bible but religion in general, it can be a very useful tool to help people. I mean, some people have been like hardcore drug users in the worst environment, terrible people. They found Jesus, they found a Bible, they become great, fantastic people, right? So I just see it as a tool. Each of these spiritual systems, whether it's New Age or um, Native American mythology, whether it's Greek, or Scandinavian mythology, whether it's biblical lore, whatever it is, um, Hindu, Vedic scriptures, Buddhism, Taoism, Baha'i faiths, each is just a tool. And you can use a tool to help you. You can use a tool to hurt you. Unfortunately, I do think a lot of people use the Bible in a non-progressive way, hurting themselves and hurting other people, even if they don't intend to. I don't think most people intend to, they just inevitably have kind of like a cult like mindset with it, but the same goes for the new age belief systems too. Um, although you can have people in the new age spectrum who are fantastic people who are using their tools for the betterment of themselves and other people, you know, you get some Christians out there who go, Oh, the new age, new age people, they're the devil. That's, that's Luciferian, right? Exact same thing as the new age people thinking that Christians are the bane of humanity's existence. It's just the same thing. It's the same pro thought process. You're just exchanging labels. So, um, yeah, you know, and we, the media, we definitely, we have respect for, for each other. We do have some people in there that are kind of more on the new agey side of things. We definitely have some people that are Christian and we all just work together because we're working for that common goal of truth, transparency, ending corruption, and um, bettering humanity. So, Well, I think this is a good example of what we were talking about earlier, earlier, that there's this middle path that the truth community and all its different little subsections and uh, little cliques and stuff really needs to come to, and that, that there is this balance between free thought and groupthink. And, you know, there is, they're, they're not antithetical, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. You can have groupthink to an extent in terms of community, collective focus, but at the same time, you can maintain sovereignty and free thought. And, and I think this is like a larger lesson that seems to be arising for humanity and strongly for the, the sort of truth or community right now is how do we find that, that personal sovereignty while not isolating ourselves from community and from the ability to collectively focus? You know, and I really feel that this is what that middle path is made up of, is, is, is reconciling groupthink and free thought on the individual level. That seems to be the way. And, you know, mm -hmm. you see something similar with like patriotism, right? Like, do you, do you personally find yourself being more patriotic than you used to be? Are you more uh, connected to nationalism, a national identity since having gone through this whole experience? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I used to be... I used to be pretty, I guess you could say left wing in my thought processes about 10 years ago or so. Uh, I thought that borders were ridiculous and yeah. the, you know, attaching yourself to a nation is, is stupid to do and you're boxing yourself in and all that. But 
now my mindset, you know, it's it's far different. And I, I still do think that a lot of the rules that we have in borders and like the imaginary lines is, is, is a little silly. But on the other hand, it, it is important to have pride about where you come from. Why, why wouldn't you, right? Why would you not have pride for your homeland and the people associated with it? I mean, if you have shame about where you live or where you're from or, or who you grew up with and all that, that, I mean, that's a problem. That's going to harm you. So, I mean, why wouldn't you? And in terms of America, at least, like this country, we're talking big picture perspective, like last two, 3,000 years. This country, America, is incredibly new. In the grand scheme of things, it's it's a hell of an experiment. Bunch of bunch of white men came over here from England. They didn't want to be controlled by the crown over there. They wanted uh, freedom of religion. They wanted freedom of speech. They wanted to, you know, it's there was a lot of great things that they tried to do with the Constitution, with creating this new colony, this new country here called America. Is it perfect? Not at all. Uh, nothing per- nothing's perfect, obviously. And there's definitely a lot of room for us to do better as a country. But comparatively, you know, comparing America to even other Western countries. Like I was, I was in Australia a couple of years ago and Australians are, they, they wish that Australia was like America. They wish they had, um, freedom of you know the right to bear arms the right to have tools to defend yourself with in australia they can't even have bear spray like pepper spray is illegal there and just look at what's happening with the government government can pretty much do whatever the hell it wants in australia and obviously criminals aren't going to follow laws criminals are going to get guns how are you going to defend yourself if a criminal comes into your house with a gun or even a knife right so there's, you know, there's definitely things we take for granted in this country that around the world, and that's just a Western country example. I mean, shoot, other countries that are far, far worse off where there's a lot more crime. Yeah, this, you know, America's great. Granted, obviously, some of these uh, social engineer groups, the globalist groups, they've definitely infiltrated America. They definitely screwed things up here. And there's a lot a lot we need to do about it, but um, yeah, you know, and and you're there in Canada. The nat, I mean, the the nationalism and the pride that those convoys were showing when they went to uh, Ottawa, Ottawa. Right? is in Ottawa. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. I'm sure even Canadians get capitals confused, and they think Toronto's the capital <laughs> sometimes, but it's <laughs> Ottawa. Uh, when that convoy went to Ottawa. And they had all the Canadian flags out and they were showing their pride. I'm like, I'm, I'm sure that that probably sent shivers down a lot of your Canadian spines because and, and a sense of like joy and happiness, like, there we go. Let's protect the homeland. Let's protect each other. Let's defend our values. Let's work for life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And you know, what, what's wrong with that? Why wouldn't you? It's it, I, I would think it's, far worse to have shame about that sort of stuff so you know you hit the nail on the head you hit the nail on the head because that was my personal experience you know i really had struggled to have a sense of national pride the convoy was the biggest moment of that for me and i'm like you i was coming years ago from a more left-wing perspective borders and nationalism was all absurd to me now i you know i'm similar in that i i still see some problems with it but i also see the overt warfare that you know is targeting nationalism and is targeting patriotism and you know, you see the deep state sees that as a problem and they want to shut that down. And so it's a very practical thing to be cultivating. But absolutely, the truckers in me was the biggest moment in my life of Canadian national pride, hands down. Yeah. And it can definitely go too far. You can definitely have not pride, but arrogance about your nation. And unfortunately, I think that's what a lot of people sort of in the patriot movement at least here in America, they kind of get arrogant about it. And they say, oh, my country is better than yours. And then it becomes this like competition. And I don't think that's helpful. But if there's a mutual respect between countries and between different nationalities, and we're all working for the common good of not just our own nation, but other nations as well, but why not love where you came from and you know wear a flag proudly about it, then I, I do find that there is 
use for that. It's resourceful to have a sort of nationalistic mindset as long as it doesn't become arrogant. Yeah. And I think that's that middle path. That's that group think versus free thought. It really, you know, exactly. that's where those things meet. Well, that's amazing, man. That, that really wraps up, you know, what I wanted to chat about today. So I really want to thank you for diving into this with me. I think group think is an important subject and uh, you know, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity where, uh, where can everyone find you and what, what, what do they uh, hit up to get all to your, to all your work? Yeah, this is a good conversation, man. It, uh, your questions are always very thought out and you ask things that usually I don't get to discuss or get asked. So always, always a pleasure to do podcasts with you, brother. Um, people can find my work on, just go to jordansather.com, I guess. And you can find where my video channels, my live stream channels and, and all of my uh, social media are. The main social media platform I'm on is Telegram at Jordan Sather. And I guess true social too, same handle. So that's pretty much it. Great. Well, thanks again for coming on and uh, I'd love to have you on again soon. Awesome, man. Let's do it. Right on.